All right, the point of this video is to help you annotate the Constitution a little bit. Every unit, um, we're going to go through the Constitution and look at the sections that relate to like whatever the content is that we're doing in class. So you should see on the Google Classroom page that there is an actual copy of the Constitution that's posted. So uh, we're going to look real quick at the elements that relate to federalism. You're welcome to print the Constitution out if it's easier for you to kind of follow along. But the idea is that we're going to like mark off the document a little bit. Uh, and you obviously can always do that if you're using the actual copy on the screen by highlighting it and then adding like a comment, right? But I'm going to actually like write on the screen itself. So again, we're just looking at the parts today that relate to federalism. So if you scroll down to page number three, you should see Article 1, Section 8, All right? So I'd like you to label Article 1, Section 8, the enumerated powers clause. Clause meaning like section or like little phrase. Uh, and we call this the enumerated powers clause because enumerated kind of means like spelled out. These are the specifically listed powers that only belong to the national government. These are only things in the section that the national government can do, uh, like coining money, uh, declaring war, like those types of things, right? So if you find them in Article 1, Section 8, they are just national government only, and they're referred to as like the enumerated powers, right? All right. All right, so we're going to scroll down a little bit. And we're going to go to page number four, and you're going to see Section 9. Section nine is referred to as oops, as the denied powers clause. And this is specifically for the national government. This is the part of the constitution that basically tells the national government, you're not allowed to do these things. Like specifically, you can't do these. So you'll notice that some of these things we've already talked about, like bills of attainder and ex post facto laws, right? These are basically things that the Articles of Confederation could do, but we said that you weren't able to do them in the constitution. You're not able to do them because it says you can't do them. Or one we haven't talked about, habeas corpus. Habeas corpus is like the basic right that you have as an American citizen that when you are uh, detained by law enforcement, that a judge has to be notified about the sort of like preliminary charges against you to decide if you should be held over for trial uh, or like released. Um, it says that the government can't take these things away from you. Right? So habeas corpus can't be denied. So these powers are powers that the national government can never engage in. All right, we're going to move again. And then if we scroll down to the next section, which is section 10, Right. And these are also denied powers, denied powers clause, but this is for state governments. So this is the part of the constitution that basically tells the national government, or excuse me, the state governments that it can't do these things, like such as like entering a into a treaty with like foreign countries. Like you wouldn't want, um, New Jersey making a treaty with England, Pennsylvania making a treaty with France. Those two countries sort of go to war with each other, and now the two states are pitted against each other too. So like Section 10 in Article 1 are all the things that the state governments can't do. All right, scrolling. Right, and now we're going deep into the document. All right, so now we're going to page number 10. And uh, I know some of you are a little intimidated by Roman numerals. We're looking at Amendment X. Uh, and Amendment X is the 10th Amendment. All right, so Amendment number 10, and this is basically known as the Reserved Powers Clause. And reserved powers are powers that only belong to like the state governments, right? So these are state government powers only, right? And just to show you how to translate amendment number 10. So it says the powers not delegated by the United States constitution, right? Um, so basically what we're talking about here is 
if it's not specifically said in Article 1, Section 8, which is like the enumerated powers clause, right? So the powers not delegated, not given by the Constitution to the national government in Article 1, Section 8, nor prohibited by it to the states. So that's the denied powers from the states belong to the states. So if Article 1, Section 8 doesn't give it to the national government, and Article 1, Section 10 doesn't say the states can't do it, uh, then it's a power that belongs to the states. So the way this is, was supposed to work is that everything was written down in Article 1, Section 8 belonged to the national government, and everything that wasn't written down uh, and not specifically said to the states you can't do this automatically belonged to the states. So the powers are reserved to the states. So everything unstated was supposed to be a state power. So this was really supposed to like, you know, maybe give the states sort of like the advantage in like who had like the most power. So like that's how the constitutional blueprint is supposed to work. However, this is not necessarily how American history has played out. So if we go back to page number four on the document, uh, we're looking at the very bottom of Article 1, Section 8, right? Where above it, all the things are basically listed that the national government is able to do. All right. So which brings us to this little phrase right here. Oops, excuse me. Right here. Right. Which basically says at the end of all the powers the national government is provided in Article 1, Section 8, it says, oh, and by the way, you also have the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Meaning, besides the things listed above, right, you could do anything that's necessary and proper to help carry out those above listed powers. Because of the wording, this is referred to as the necessary and proper clause. Whoops, proper clause. And sometimes this is just referred to as the elastic clause because it stretches the power of like the federal government, All right? Since 1819, the Supreme Court has basically interpreted this wording of the constitution to dramatically expand the power of the federal government. So we're gonna show you how this works real quick. It's one of the most important parts of the entire constitution. All right, so if we go back up to our, the rest of article one, section eight, these are all the things the national government is provided the ability to do, right? Because of the necessary and proper clause and the Supreme Court's interpretation of that wording, the way that they interpret that amendment is basically like, it doesn't have to be written down exactly in the document for the national government to be able to do it. That if it's just close, if you can relate it to something that's written down, the courts will generally let you get away with it. So for example, for a couple times in our country's history, um, the United States government has had to implement a draft, forcing people to fight in the military against their will because the military conflict that was going on at the time was like so significant that it needed like larger numbers of like armed forces. So like nowhere in the constitution does it say that the national government has the ability to implement a draft, but it does basically say the national government has the ability to raise and support armies, uh, to basically provide and maintain a Navy. It doesn't really give a whole lot of specific details. So when the United States government wanted to implement a draft, they basically said what we want to do is not listed, but it's related to something that is. So we should be able to get away with that. We should be able to do that. It's kind of silly to think that we can only do exactly what's listed in the document. And the courts generally have agreed because of the wording of that necessary and proper clause. And this expands the power of the national government to allow them to do more than what's specifically listed in the document. Um, to show you a couple other examples, uh, this clause right here, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states, this is referred to as the Commerce Clause. And we may not say commerce, but we say economy. The government has the ability to regulate the economy. This clause is so general that basically the United States government uses this to try to link up to what it wants to do. It uses the necessary and proper clause, and then what it wants to do, it'll link up to the commerce clause because economic regulations are so broad. So again, the word education is not listed anywhere in the constitution, but the ability to regulate the economy is. 
So we know that the national government has gotten involved with education. Well, how do they do that if it's not listed in the document? It's because you basically say that, okay, we have the power to regulate the economy. The more educated our citizens are, the better the economy is. So that helps provide the government with the ability to then make education initiatives and policies, even though it's not listed in the document, right? So the significance is that the interpretation of the necessary proper clause by the court since 1819 has, again, really altered the balance of power. It's not that the, the states get to do everything that's like not listed in the Constitution, because what the national government has done is just like can get away with doing stuff if they link up what they want to do to something that is like in the Constitution. This has dramatically expanded the power of the federal government and taking power away from the states.